chapter three in your book doesn't really use Excel whatsoever. Everything is done kind of by pencil and paper. So I don't have any Excel skills to teach you for chapter three, but these are a lot of fun. I actually love chapter three the most. It's my favorite chapter in this course. And so I thought it might be helpful to just work a bunch of examples together to give you a little bit more, um, I guess, direction and guidance on how to do some of these problems. So in this video, I'm going to do a couple of examples and hopefully it will help you figure out your homework. So the first one, a group of students were asked if they carry a credit card. Their responses are listed in the table below. So in our table we have freshman and sophomore, and it tells us the number in each class that carry a credit card and don't carry a credit card, and then the totals. So the question says, if a student is selected at random, find the probability that he or she owns a credit card given that the student is a freshman. Now that given is very important. We're establishing that the student is a freshman. So right away, the only people we care about are the freshmen. So that limits our sample size to just the 60 freshmen. We no longer care about the sophomores. We only care about the freshmen. So we're just looking at the 60 freshmen, and then we want to know how many of them own a credit card. And so looking there, we see that 40 of the freshmen carry a credit card. So the probability that somebody owns a credit card, given that they're a freshman, that vertical line means given, is 40 out of 60. And for me, you can leave your answers as unreduced fractions. You do not have to do the math or simplify them whatsoever. I'm happy with you leaving your answers just like this for projects and tests. So the next one, a group of students were asked if they carry a credit card. Their responses are listed in the table, and it's the same table from last time. But now the question says, if a student is selected at random, find the probability that he or she is a sophomore and owns a credit card. So we want them to be a sophomore and have a credit card. So we want to see how many people in the table are considered sophomores and they have a credit card. So if you look at the sophomore row and the credit card column, where those intersect are the people that are both. They're sophomores and they have a credit card. So it's like there's 25 people that are both sophomores and have a credit card out of the 100. So the probability that somebody's a sophomore and owns a credit card is 25 out of 100. Next example, find the probability of getting four consecutive aces when four cards are drawn without replacement from a standard deck of 52 playing cards. And just a side note, you do need to know all 52 cards in the deck. You could be asked a question on your test and you'll need to know what's in a deck. So if you don't know your deck of cards, go play some poker or something so that you can figure it out. All right, so this question says, what's the probability of getting four consecutive aces when doing it without replacement? So that means we're going to draw a card and put it to the side, and then draw another card and put it to the side, and so on four times. So we're going to draw four cards individually, and we are not going to put them back into the deck. So on our first draw, we have all the cards in there, and there are four aces in a deck. So for our first draw, we'll have all four aces out of all 52 cards. So let's say we draw one of them. Now you've got to ask yourself, how many aces are left? Well, if we've taken one ace out and put it to the side, that means there's only three aces left in the deck. And since we took the card away, there's 51 cards left. So for our second draw, we would have three out of 51 aces left in the deck. So I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So you can see the first draw, we had four out of 52 that were aces. We took an ace away. So now we have three aces left and only 51 cards left. So for the second draw, we have a 3 out of 51 chance of getting an ace. Let's say we do that and we put that ace to the side. Now we only have two aces left and we're down to 50 total cards. So for our third draw, we have a 2 out of 50 chance of getting an ace. Then we take it away. And now we're down to just one ace left in the deck and 49 cards left. So we're going to draw an ace and then an ace and then an ace and then an ace without replacement. And here we have the probability for each draw. And since we're doing four things in a row, we multiply them together. And again, I'm perfectly happy if you leave your answers as unreduced fractions, just like this. It will minimize your chance of making a silly typo, and it actually helps me figure out your thought process and give you more points. Similar example, but slightly different. Now we want to find the probability of getting four consecutive aces when four cards are drawn from, or four cards are drawn with replacement from a standard deck of 52 playing cards. So this time we're going to draw a card out, and then we're going to put it back, shuffle them up, and then do another draw. So we're not removing them, we're actually replacing them. So when we go to make our first draw, we have four aces 
out of 52 cards. So we have a 4 out of 52 chance of getting an ace. So we take it away, see it's an ace, put it back in shuffle. Well, we still have all four aces and all 52 cards. So for this example, the probability of getting an ace each time is 4 out of 52 because we're putting the card back in and reshuffling. We still have everything in there. So example 3A, those were dependent events because the probability was changing each time. Because we were taking cards away, we were changing the probability of the next draw. But this example, we have independent events because the probability is exactly the same every time because we're putting that card back in the deck and we're not changing the odds of each subsequent draw. Last example. This one's the fun one. It says the probability it will rain is 40% each day over a three-day period. What is the probability it will rain at least one of the three days? So the keyword here is that it says at least one of the three days. At least one means that it could be raining one day or two days or all three days. At least one means one or more. This is actually a really messy problem and you really don't have the mathematical skills to do it this way, to figure out the at least one day and then that two days and the three days. It's actually pretty messy. But we can use the complement rule to make it a lot easier and doable at our level. So we need to think about what is the complement. Well, our event is raining at least one day. So that means, again, it's one day or two days or three days of rain. The complement is the opposite scenario. The opposite case in this case is that we have no rain. So the, the event is one or two or three days. The only other scenario, which is the complement, is no days of rain. So our complement is that we do not get any rain on the three days. So what the complement tells us is that finding our probability of rain at least one day is equal to one minus the probability of no rain on the three days. Well, we need to figure out what's the probability of no rain before we can figure out the probability of no rain on three days. So the problem told us that the probability of rain on one day was 0.4. So the probability of no rain on a single day is a complement. So it's one minus 0.4 to give us the 0.6. So again, the probability it rains is 40%. Probability it doesn't rain is 60%. So that's the probability it does not rain on one day. Well, Again, probability no rain on a single day is 60%. So we're trying to find the probability of no rain on three days, which means we need to find the probability it doesn't rain the first day, and then the probability it doesn't rain the second day, and then the probability it doesn't rain the third day. So that's going to be probability of no rain on day one, which is 0.6, times probability of no rain on day two, which is 0.6, times the probability of no rain on day three, which is also 0.6. So the probability it does not rain on three days, three consecutive days, is 0.6 times 0.6 times 0.6. And then the complement rule says we need to plug that into our formula to find that the probability we have rain on at least one day is 1 minus the probability we do not have any rain on three days, which is 1 minus 0.6 times 0.6 times 0.6.